Hello and welcome to the Week in 60 Minutes, brought to you by Spectator TV and broadcast on Thursday, September 2nd. I'm Cindy Yu, the Spectator's broadcast editor. We've got a great show for you this week. The Spectator's chairman, Andrew Neil, will be returning to the show to tell us about the bargain that the Scottish Greens have struck with Nicola Sturgeon in return for a seat at the table of government. We'll also be debating with animal welfare campaigner Dominic Dyer. You might have seen him advocating for the safe evacuation of pen farthings dogs and cats, on whether human lives are worth more than animal lives. And is boarding school to blame for lacklustre British politicians? Richard Beard thinks so, he is himself a product of the institution, and he joins the show to talk about his new book on the matter, Sad Little Men. Before we get going, if you enjoy what we do on Spectator TV, then subscribe to our YouTube channel for free. Click the button at the bottom of this video and then tap the bell icon to make sure you never miss an episode. And why not subscribe to The Spectator magazine too? We're giving Spectator TV viewers an exclusive offer. You can get 10 weeks of The Spectator for just £10 and a free bottle of PIMS when you subscribe at spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. It's a fantastic offer and we're only running it while stocks last, so hurry. Now, before I'm joined by Andrew Neil, let's hear from our home team of excellent journalists, James Forsyth, Katie Balls and Kate Andrews on the political situation this week. James and Katie, welcome to Spectator TV. Now, James, to start with you, Dominic Raab is in Doha as we film. What's his mission there? His mission there is essentially, it's part of a regional tour, to start working on trying to get out those Afghans who, have, who worked or helped with the British mission and are still in Afghanistan. It is essentially an attempt to try and secure safe passage for them out of the country. I think one thing that there is concern about in both London and Washington is you know, what reprisals might there be against those who worked with NATO forces and you know, the moral responsibility that is owed to those people. And there are still a large number of those people who have been left behind in Afghanistan, which is obviously now under Taliban control. James, am I rightly thinking, though, that the Taliban was operating out of Doha before its uh, resurgence in Afghanistan? So would the Qataris actually help the British side here? Yeah, I mean, the idea is that the Qataris are the people who have influence on the Taliban. You know, if you want to, if you want to try and persuade the Taliban to do something, the idea goes that they're the people who can help you with that. They've hosted since 2013 the Taliban's political office. And I think one of the aims is to try and use them to put pressure on the Taliban to keep Kabul International Airport open. Obviously, there is some difficulty here because uh, other countries will be reluctant to grant overflight rights to a plane setting off from Afghanistan unless they have some assurances on the security on the ground. So there is talk of whether the Turks or the Qataris could provide the airport security. The Taliban are obviously sensitive to the idea of, you know, of, of kind of foreign troops on their soil running the airport. So I think it's trying to negotiate all of these things. And then I think the other question is, can you persuade uh, countries in the neighbourhood that are obviously very worried about a huge influx of refugees from Afghanistan? Can you persuade them to accept those people who are going to end up being granted asylum in, in Western countries? And Katie, you've got a very interesting interview in this week's Spectator with Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary. And it's clear that there's no love lost between him and Dominic Raab at the moment, isn't there? I mean, how are relations between the two men? So you have a situation where they're not directly attacking one another, but when you look at the various things they're saying and their version of events, they, uh, so they do not come together in a harmonious fashion. Uh, so you have Dominic Raab trying to explain uh, the chaotic scenes in Kabul, how the UK was caught on the hop by blaming military intelligence, saying the intelligence failed. And then you have Ben Wallace, the Defence Secretary, in the interview with me and The Spectator, saying that uh, failures of intelligence aren't what, what went wrong because there isn't really such a thing as a failure of intelligence when it comes in this context, when it comes to the end of a regime, when it comes to a crisis like this, what you get is a, you know, there are limits of intelligence. And it d did feel to me as though that was a rebuke to this idea that though this was the thing that went wrong and nothing else could be read. You also had Ben Wallace talking about the fact that 
he was uh, warning in July that things had to move faster because the game was up. Now, if you look at Dominic Raab's timetable, uh, he was saying in his select committee appearance that ultimately no one could have known this. And I think what's tricky for Raab is not just what Ben Wallace is saying. You also have an internal Foreign Office memo which suggested uh, that in July they were also warned that the situation could escalate in Afghanistan very quickly. And now, Dominic Raab's response is, well, you hear lots of things and uh, there's some of this advice, you get different advice, but I think it's just adding up to this picture where it just does not feel so credible that Dominic Raab was completely taken by surprise and others um, by how quickly things moved. And especially when you consider his holiday ans- uh, questions to which he refused to answer at the um, Foreign Affairs Select Committee as well, because he may well have been already on holiday at this point. Um, Katie, on, on, on the relationship between the two men and their prospects in Cabinet, there have been briefings around Westminster that only one of them can stay in a future reshuffle. Is Ben Wallace in a better stead with the Parliamentary Party than Dominic Raab at the moment? Certainly within the Parliamentary Party, I would say Ben Wallace is one of the few uh, figures in government whose stock in a way has almost risen um, through the crisis. I think uh, his engagement with MPs and uh, the way that MOD has worked on this has been something which you, you see public praise for. So uh, I think figures such as Johnny Mercer, um, you know, former Defence Minister, backbenchers who've been quite critical of the government have found praise for Ben Wallace. I think when it comes to Cabinet, um, there's obviously been a pile-on against Dominic Raab, but it's worth remembering that Boris Johnson doesn't really play by conventional wisdom when it comes to moving people from his cabinet. Um, sackings rarely happen. If ever, resignations, uh, you know, is not something that he really prompts people to do. And therefore, I think it is quite hard to predict uh, what will happen to Dominic Raab in, in any reshuffle. I think that one of the things I'm now hearing, though, is the fact that we are seeing this blame game play out in public uh, between the Home Office, the MOD and the Foreign Office it looks dysfunctional and I think that is actually now reflecting on Boris Johnson, the fact that you have a situation where he is overseeing a government where there isn't a clear narrative and people seem to be letting almost their dirty laundry play out in public. Mm. And James, on that Ben Wallace interview, what did you think of his point that uh, it was obvious that the UK is not a superpower, but also that the US might not even be a superpower, just a, just a global power, just a strong power, given what's happening in Afghanistan? Yeah, I think it's it, interesting. There were some pointed comments towards the end of the interview, and he talks. Joe Biden kept saying that he wants to end the forever war in Afghanistan, and Ben Wallace is essentially arguing that standing up for your for your values is a forever commitment. Uh, and I think that that I think it's very hard not to read that as a as a dig at the Biden decision to pull out. I think it's been quite clear for some time that the the view in the Ministry of Defence is look, you know, from about 2013 2014 onwards. The NATO had found a way of staying in Afghanistan with a relatively light footprint. Uh, the Afghan army did the fighting, but there were a few thousand uh, uh, US and NATO forces there, and crucially, air support being provided to, to the Afghan army. And I think it is no secret that that is what the UK would have liked to see continue. I think one of the interesting things here is that it's quite clear that if you read Joe, Joe Biden's speech on, on Tuesday night justifying the withdrawal, that you know, his essential argument is you know, the US is now involved in a great power competition with, with China and to a lesser extent Russia, and he wishes to kind of get out of all of these uh, post-9-11 entanglements that, that he regards uh, uh, as kind of superfluous to that struggle, and that you know, the US is essentially planning to return to that pre-9-11 approach of over, what, you know, over the horizon capabilities. Essentially what that means is, you know, you hear about a terrorist training camp somewhere, you fire a bunch of cruise missiles into it. You know, George Bush famously said after 9-11 that you know, he wasn't going to do that anymore because he didn't think it was effective. You were sending you know, a, two billion, uh, sorry, a $2 million missile to hit an empty $10 tent and a camel in the butt. Uh, but I think the US is going back to that strategy when it comes to uh, these kind of terrorist facilities. And Katie, let's talk a little bit about what's happening back at home as well, because we're counting down the days to the return to school. Um, Cases have been falling throughout the summer, but is there nervousness that when school returns, it will change? Yes, because if you look at Scotland, where cases are rocketing, um, 
that is being attributed to pupils uh, going back to the classroom in part and I think therefore ministers are worried and now you're seeing it move into a debate about child vaccination. Uh, previously the government uh, was fairly divided, you didn't get the sense there was a strong uh, overwhelming view in cabinet that they were pro child vaccination for the over 12s but I think that started to shift so you're hearing Gavin Williamson uh, among others uh, almost putting pressure on uh, the body, uh, the medical body that uh, recommends this to come up with a decision. Um, and I think there is a frustration I'm picking up from ministers that they cannot progress on this um, when lots of countries are far ahead. Now, if the UK does decide to go ahead with child vaccination, which seems to be what the government is leaning towards, if they get to that point, I think it will be uh, not without controversy, but I think that is now the, the clear direction of travel in terms of what Boris Johnson would like to see as one way of tackling um, what they expect to be uh, jumping cases when people return. And James, let's talk about that um, vaccination point because the government is trying to pressurise the JCVI in order to to allow booster shots, but they're not getting very they're not getting anywhere, are they? Yeah, I mean, it's worth thinking back to the, the, to the beginning of the vaccination programme. You know, the UK was the first country to, to give someone a COVID vaccine outside of a clinical trial. And ministers then were full of praise for uh, the MHRA and the JCVI. But there is now a clear tension between ministers and the JCVI because ministers want to get going for booster campaign. The JCVI have so far only approved a booster shot for those people with um, suppressed immune systems. Uh, I think it's also quite clear, as, as Katie was saying, that, you know, um, and as I quote someone involved in the planning for the return to schools, the magazine this week saying, you know, they thought that ministers thought they would be further down the age cohorts by now before the return to school. I think they are looking quite enviously at those countries that have for quite some time been vaccinating everyone over 12. Um, and I, so I think this is, this is going to become a tension because, you know, as Katie says, you know, the Scottish example does suggest that you will see a spike in cases. You know, it's worth remembering that with the return of education this month, you know, schools, colleges and universities, that's about 13 million people changing their daily routine. It would be very surprising if that didn't have an effect on the COVID case numbers. And James, as you write in your political column for this week's Spectator, the government seems to be in a bit of a paradox where they should be doing well, they seem to be doing well, but they don't feel like they're doing well. Can you explain what's going on there? Yeah, I think it's a very odd thing. You know, the Tories have been in, in government for 11 years. You know, Now, after New Labour had been in government for 11 years, they were about 19 points behind the Tories in the polls. Um, after the Tories had been in power for 11 years in 1990, following that, those victories in 79, 83 and 87, they were regularly behind by double digits. Yet the Tories are consistently um, still ahead in the polls, 11 years after first taking office. You, know, you combine that with Keir Starmer's rating, you know, YouGov poll out this week had his approval rating at minus 39. And you'd think that the Tories would be in fairly triumphalist mood, but they're not. And I think when Tory MPs return uh, to the Commons next week, they will do so in a, in a strikingly subdued mood. Um, I was talking to one cabinet minister this week, and they were saying, you know, they always thought that MPs returning to Westminster, you know, the end of these COVID restrictions in Parliament, packed benches in the Commons, would be a big boost uh, to party morale and to the government because you know, you'd have that numerical advantage in the, in, the, in the chamber again. And they said that they're now, they're now not so sure because they, they think the mood is, 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 is sufficiently glum that, um, that, that you're not going to get that boost out of it. James and Katie, thanks very much for joining Spectator TV. Now let's take a closer look at those COVID numbers with Kate Andrews, our economics editor who puts together the Spectator's daily lunchtime briefing, which is the only newsletter you need for COVID news from the UK and around the world. Kate, over to you. Thanks, Cindy. On this first graph, you're looking at the seven-day average for COVID infections in England, which as you can see have been slightly on the decline for about a week now, notably below the peak of the reopening wave over the summer, but the virus is still circulating as we would expect given how many of the restrictions have now been lifted. This slight dip is interesting in the context of cases in Scotland, where as you can see here, the virus is still on the rise. It's been thought at moments over the summer that England was following Scotland's trajectory, but they're moving in different directions now. There are of course key differences. Scottish schools have been back for several weeks, and this increase may well be a result of schools returning. When English schools are back in full force, it's expected that this could lead to an increase, even a spike in the number of cases. So England may be following in Scotland's footsteps in the coming weeks. We wait and see. 
Of course, in both England and Scotland, the crucial metrics remain hospitalization and death. In England, hospitalizations remain roughly 80% below their peak, and when we look at COVID deaths, it's roughly 92 to 93% below the peak. So that's, on the face of it, good news. A lot of eyes now are turning away from the UK and towards Israel, which appears to be undergoing a fourth wave, possibly a bad sign for the UK's prospects of handling the virus in the months ahead. Again, though, context is key. Perhaps the biggest point to make here is that Israel has just been flooded with the Delta variant, which it's experiencing now, something that the UK experienced earlier this summer. The UK also decided to leave a longer gap between the first and second vaccines, which may create stronger immunity against the virus. But evidence is increasing in both the UK and Israel that immunity built up from vaccines starts to wane, not disappear, but wane around four to six months post-jab. The crucial point is that we're talking about infection. When it comes to severe illness and preventing against it, so far vaccines continue to hold up well. Still, this has strengthened the case for booster shots. This last graph here shows that cases of severe COVID illness were on track to double every two weeks in Israel until the booster program kicked in. Now, it's early days and there could be other explanations for this, so let's not get too excited. But no doubt, a major topic this autumn will be those booster jabs here in the UK and to what extent they're necessary to increase protection, especially for the vulnerable and elderly. Back to you, Cindy. Kate Andrews, thank you for that. Now, if you enjoyed Kate's insights and the numbers that The Spectator are putting together on COVID, do check out our COVID data hub at spectator.co.uk forward slash data. On there, you'll find the latest information on national numbers, the vaccine tracker, and much more. Or you can subscribe to Kate's daily newsletter to get the highlights in your inbox, spectator.co.uk forward slash lunchtime dash briefing. Next, this week I'm delighted to welcome back The Spectator's chairman, Andrew Neil. He's been closely following the pact that the Scottish Greens have signed up with the SNP, or another ploy for independence. But is it a good deal for the SNP, or the Greens, or Scotland? Andrew, welcome back to Spectator TV. Good to be back and great to see Spectator TV doing so well. This is very weird because we're reversing positions here, but tell us about, tell us about what's going on with the Green Party and the SNP north of the border, because have they struck some kind of Faustian bargain? Well, they certainly struck some kind of deal. It's not a full-blooded coalition, uh, but it's a semi-coalition, and the Greens get uh, two positions in government now, two in uh, Nicola Sturgeon's government, two positions specially created for them. I mean, one will be a minister for zero carbon buildings, active travel, which I think means walking, uh, and tenants' rights, and they're going to go for rent controls. The other will be the minister for green skills, a circular economy, I'm not quite sure what that is, and biodiversity. I mean, I, this is how you pick ministerial jobs, by just going into a dictionary and picking out words <laughs> and adding the titles in. They've been entirely created for these two. They've never been in government before. Um, I think it's it's all optics. It's a bit performative here from Nicola Sturgeon's uh, point of view. I think that um, she failed in the May Scottish Parliament elections. She did incredibly well, but she failed to get an overall majority. Uh, but if she now brings the seven green votes in, she can claim that she has a, quote, super majority in Parliament for a second independence referendum, which she hopes she will win. Now, there's a, a bit of uh, manoeuvring here, because the fact is that Nicola Sturgeon could always count on the votes of the Greens for a second referendum anyway. And I think it's simply, she's got very little red meat at the moment to give her own supporters. And this is at least something come the SNP conference this month that she can throw at them to say, you know, I've now built in, guaranteed, a supermajority for a second rev referendum. The Greens get their feet in government. These two characters uh, get another £30,000 a year each uh, for their wonderful roles in zero carbon buildings and uh, circular economy. And, um, and I think there's probably the second reason why there's something in it. For, I mean, there's a lot of downsides which we can come on to. I think the second uh, performative or optical reason for Nicola Sturgeon is that COP26, the great big climate jamboree uh, coming up in Glasgow in November, uh, I mean, that's a Boris Johnson show. Uh, mm -hmm. And Nicola Sturgeon, uh, as the minister of only a devolved parliament, has felt a bit left out. 
She'll now be able to mingle with the great and the good, saying, I'm now in coalition with the Greens. The Greens are part of my government. That is how uh, much I'm a, I'm a Greenie uh, myself. And I think that will help us strut the international stage a bit. Well, I did think it was funny, though, that Greta Thunberg, this sort of Joan of Arc character for the Green Movement, you know, she said that Scotland is not a world leader on climate change. That can't have been convenient for Nicola Sturgeon. It wasn't convenient for Nicola Sturgeon, and it shows how the cybernats, uh, these uh, terribly pleasant people on Twitter and so (laughs) on, uh, will turn on a sixpence before poor Miss Thunberg, who, who, who said something, which actually isn't that controversial. Uh, you know, Scotland isn't really a world leader and this. is pretty good at renewables, but on all sorts of other things, it's still way behind. She says that Scotland isn't a world leader. And suddenly this international icon, this global icon, is being duffed over as if she was in Sucky Hall Street on a Saturday night. Um, <laughs> as the pubs closed uh, and fighting broke out. Um, and there were terrible things being said about her. So it, it, it shows that you, you can get their support, but the moment you say something they don't like, they're down on you like a ton of bricks. They're, they're not, I, this will come as a surprise to you, they're, they're not the nicest people. <laughs> and, and Andrew, when it comes to the Greens, you've written that they make the Greens south of the border sound sensible by comparison. Now, you've talked a little bit about the circular economy um, and other things, but what, what do they stand for and how much more radical are they? Well, put it this way, the the English Greens are a lot more radical than the German Greens, uh, who are very grown-up Greens, and they've been in government before, and they could well be in government in Germany again after the elections later this month. So the English Greens are not as grown-up as the German Greens, who are actually now a moderate centre-left Green Party. Uh, And the Scottish Greens are nowhere near as moderate as the English Greens. They're pretty much outliers in the Green spectrum. And they they want to abolish the royal family. You know, lots of people want to do that. That's not not particularly radical. But they want to confiscate all their lands as well. They want a wealth tax. And if the Scottish um, Parliament doesn't have power for a wealth tax, which it probably doesn't at the moment, they say that should be done by local authorities. Well, anybody who knows local authorities in Scotland, <laughs> giving them a wealth tax would put the fear of death into you. Uh, <laughs> there. They are anti car, they are uh, anti, above all, anti economic growth. They want rent controls. And the one thing that, you know, economists really agree about anything, but the one thing that economists on the left and the right agree about is how terrible rent controls are. Uh, that isn't just a Milton Friedman or the Adam Smith Institute. Uh, Paul Krugman, the left-wing economist who writes for the New York Times, Nobel Prize winner, he said that rent controls are a disaster. Everywhere they've been introduced, Berlin, Stockholm, uh, even at some extent in New York in days gone by, they lead to terrible shortages of rental uh, property. But that's what they want. Now, Nicola Sturgeon is a canny politician, and she has not given them their wish list. Uh, at all. Uh, And indeed, she has basically ring-fenced the economy from this anti-economic growth uh, faction. And she's not agreed that if you do more than one return flight a year, you pay an escalating rate of tax for every other flight. She's not stupid. She's not going to go down that road uh, either. The Scots like their summer holidays in the sun. Um, But it is a problem for her because she has aligned herself in terms of public perception perception with a clear anti-growth, anti-capitalist, anti-market economy party. I mean, Mr. Harvey, the co-head of the Greens, has said that he wants capitalism must end. He said (laughs) not that long ago how he intends to do that. uh, We don't know. And I think it's a problem for Nicola Sturgeon uh, as far as business is concerned and foreign investment, which Scotland needs a lot of, or even investment from England uh, as well, because Nicola Sturgeon was already seen as not as business friendly as uh, Alex Salmond, her predecessor. Alex was, uh, was seen as being, yes, a social democrat, but when it came to business in the economy, he'd been a former economist at the Royal Bank of Scotland, Uh, He knew what he was talking about. He was actually in favour of very low rates of corporation tax, 
uh, which was attractive to business. Nicola Sturgeon uh, jumped that. She's just, I mean, I remember interviewing Alex Salmons once up in, uh, just outside Aberdeen in a hotel that was owned by one of his big supporters. This was a businessman. And he, he just said, Alex Salmon, he's going to be great for business. Uh, you know, he really understands how business operates. No one's saying that about Nicola Sturgeon. And mm. uh, now she's in bed with the Greens, who are clearly an anti-business policy, anti-investment in roads, anti-upgrading uh, roads, anti-economic uh, growth. Uh, oil and gas, a huge issue still in Scotland. 100,000 well-paid jobs depending on it. They are against further development of oil and gas. Uh, the Greens have said they are responsible for quite a significant change of direction in the Scottish government when it comes to oil and gas. So when you add all that up, it, it, it re reduces Scotland's attractiveness as a place to do business and a place in which you might consider investing. Mm. And could it also backfire on the Greens? As you mentioned, Nicola Sturgeon hasn't given them their most radical demands or many demands at all. And it almost seems like a law of nature for coalitions that the smaller party gets eaten up. Yes, it does, as uh, Nick Clegg will tell you, uh, after his experience with David Cameron and George Osborne. I mean, I think it does have uh, dangers for the Greens, and we did, we've already seen it. Um, uh, at the weekend, uh, maybe just before the weekend, uh, Patrick Harvey, one of the two leaders of the Scottish Greens, uh, attacked the very idea of vaccine passports. Mm. Uh, and what have we seen? Well, we've seen the... Uh, Scottish government yesterday effectively announced the introduction of vaccine passports. And uh, Patrick Harvey and his uh, co-government minister, Lorna Slater, the other co-leader of the Greens, are the two now in government. They're just going to have to suck that up. And meanwhile, the Green Party uh, has issued a statement saying they're very worried about vaccine passports. So it has a lot of problems uh, for them. I think there's also a huge issue, I don't want to get uh, too parochial here, but these things matter in Scotland, is the upgrading of the A9 road, that's the road from Perth to Inverness, and the A96, which is the road from Aberdeen to Inverness. These are dangerous roads at the moment. They're not all dual carriageway. And uh, it is a very popular policy, which the SNP have supported to fully dual, to make them fully dual carriage. Uh, way roads make them safer, make them easier to drive on. It's not clear that the Greens want to go along with that. Uh, indeed, I'm pretty sure they don't want to go along with it. So there's a plenty of opportunity, I think, for some grit in the oyster here. Mm. But as you say, it's all about independence. Uh, with Nicola Sturgeon's got this conference coming up in the autumn. Can you give us a look ahead to what that independence reigniting of that debate will look like? Because she's been relatively quiet in recent months because of COVID, I guess, uh, in, in pushing that course. Uh, the line has been, Cindy, that they don't want to push independence or a second referendum, which is an essential first stage towards the possibility of independence until they've got on top of COVID. Now, that's a problem for them because we learned yesterday from the World Health, World Health Organization that 50% of the top 20 COVID hotspots in the world are now in Europe, now in Scotland. 50%. So not quite clear that they're actually getting on top of COVID. Uh, but nevertheless, she has her party activists uh, that she has to feed this red meat to. There's not a lot else she has to talk about. If you look at the record on education or mm -hmm. uh, in schools or health uh, or crime now, where there's uh, problems with the latest crime figures in, in Scotland, or even in infrastructure. I mean, other than the new bridge over, new bridge over the fourth, there is, there's not a lot of major infrastructure. The, the main road between Glasgow and Edinburgh, which is the main uh, artery in central Scotland, is still something that's now about 50 years out of date. Uh, there's no high-speed railways in Scotland. There's no totemic infrastructure other than the bridge, which closes in bad weather, by the way, too. So you wouldn't want to make that too uh, to totemic. Uh, so she's not got a lot of red meat to throw. All that matters for them is independence. This... With alliance with the Greens helps her get through that. She also thinks it's now a stronger argument with Boris Johnson. She can say, look, I've got a super majority in the Holyrood uh, uh, Parliament. I've got 72 out of 129 votes 
when I add in the Greens for independence or for a second referendum, so you can't deny that to me. Uh, but I think Mr Johnson will, uh, and I think he'll say, look, until there's a, a, a clear indication that the Scots want a second referendum, and there isn't yet, uh, very few, only I think about 35% wanted on Nicola Sturgeon's timetable, I think he'll just say no. And there was a significant development from the Scottish Secretary of State in the past days where he actually firmed up on what the yardstick would be for a second referendum, which was that the polls for a prolonged period of time need to show 60% or more of Scots want a second referendum. Now, they're nowhere near that at the moment. I, I, he got criticised for saying that, but actually I think it was a shrewd move because if the Westminster government does not give some kind of criteria as to what would trigger a second referendum, then Nicola Sturgeon could rightly argue that there was no democratic route to independence. Yes. That there was no that the Westminster government should, could just say no, no, no. Now you can argue whether sixty percent is high enough or too high. That's one thing. But they've set a yardstick now, which means that there is a democratic route to a second independence referendum if it is the clear, and to use a favourite uh, phrase of the Scottish Nationalists, the settled will of the Scottish people that they want a second referendum. Very interesting, Andrew. And while I've got you here, I know that you've been following the situation in Afghanistan very closely. Um, yeah. In all of your years of doing journalism, how big of a moment do you think that the last month that we've seen will be considered by history books? Oh, I think uh, this is a watershed moment. I think it's huge. It com you know, it's com been compared to previous historic events uh, in modern times. But actually, I think it, it, it combines uh, all, all of them. It, uh, it combines the retreat from Saigon uh, in 1975. Uh, actually, the retreat from Saigon was done in a rather more measured way, <laughs> despite that <laughs> helicopter, famous helicopter picture coming off the US Embassy. Uh, there was a much more measured retreat uh, because the, the Saigon government lasted for two years uh, mm -hmm. after the Americans had effectively withdrawn. It didn't all just happen overnight, despite that uh, totemic picture. So I think it's as big as that. It has elements of farce and embarrassment of the Bay of Pigs invasion uh, when the CIA sponsored a anti-communist Cuban re rebellion in in invasion, which ended in farce and total victory uh, for Fidel Castro, secured his position in power, in fact. And, of course, the hostage situation in Tehran in 1980. Uh, and we know that there are still a number of American citizens, not just allies of America, a number of American citizens who are still in Afghanistan, including 32 students from California. Mm -hmm. Now, there is Mr. Biden's next crisis, staring him in the face. How does he get these kids out? What were they doing there in the first place is another matter, but how does he get them out? So I think if you look at this, uh, it has all the elements of the Bay of Pigs, Saigon, and the Tehran hostage crisis rolled into one. And out of that humiliation and embarrassment uh, and the, the denigration of American power and American standing in the world comes major geopolitical changes, which yes. can only strengthen the position of China in places like Pakistan, as well as Afghanistan, and of Russia in the Central Asian stands, the, the, the stands that used to be Soviet, parts of the Soviet empire. And you can even see an emboldening of Iran with Russian and Chinese support in the Middle East as well. Mm -hmm. So I think the geopolitical ramifications of this uh, embarrassment and humiliation uh, have yet to unfold. And I see that Mr. Biden has said, I was just uh, looking that he said that uh, the war was now over, the Afghan war was now over. That's the exact phrase. The war in Afghanistan is now over. Well, the jihadists don't believe that. I think ISIS-K, the Akani network, Al-Qaeda, will all be pouring in there again to use it as a base. The jihadists certainly don't believe that. And I fear that far from being over, it's simply the next phase of the war, not it being over and a more dangerous phase. Anjaneel, thank you so much for joining us on the show. 
Now, if you're enjoying the show, we think that you'd also enjoy The Spectator magazine with all its online print and archive content. You can access all that we offer and have a free bottle of pins when you subscribe at spectator.co.uk forward slash TV offer. Now, it's been a summer of animal stories from Geronimo the alpaca to pen farthings, dogs and cats. It's often said that Britain is a nation of animal lovers, but has the last few months shown that we've actually taken this to the extreme? Two in five Brits now say that animal lives are worth just as much as human lives. Will Moore, The Spectator's features editor, rails against this moral reprioritization in this week's Spectator cover article, and he joins Spectator TV today. Together with the animal rights campaigner Dominic Dyer, who has been on the forefront of these animal welfare stories. Now, Will, you write that these are signs of moral collapse. How so? The point I make about moral collapse is it's, it comes when uh, you put animal life at the expense of human life. That's where it's a problem. There is, of course, nothing wrong with loving animals. Um, I think the reason politicians always say we're a nation of animal lovers is because it is true and it is so obviously true and that's a very good thing. But uh, love can uh, go wrong. Um, you can love um, like Othello, uh, not wisely but too well. And, and it's, when, it's when love uh, for animals gets into the territory where, where instead of just caring for them and having high standards of animal welfare, which is a very good thing, that um, you start to treat animals as if they have rights as akin to human rights. And that is where I think it gets very worrying. And that's where I think, I, I do think it, 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 it's a sign of moral collapse because we, we're in a, we, you get to a stage whereby there's a lot of people in this country who are much more concerned with, uh, you know, with, with animals and dogs and cats and so on than they are with uh, you know, uh, how the Taliban treat women, for example, because they, that's what they have that's what they are passionate about. So it's a point really about um, public perception, uh, I think, more than anything. Well, there was that incredible YouGov poll that came out recently that said actually two-fifths of people in the UK actually think that animals' lives are worth as much as human lives. Well, yes, exactly. I mean, so the, the, and that's, yes, that's a poll from last week, and uh, that is a point about public perception uh, of events. Um, you know, I'm sure we, Dominic and I are about to talk about Operation Arc, uh, but my... my my point really is it's, it's, it's bigger than uh, Operation Arc itself, it's how the public responded to it. That's what I really was interested in with the piece. It's, it's, a, it's a shift in public attitude uh, and it's a shift that I think takes one dangerous step too far. It, it, it takes this well-meaning uh, instinct, which is to love nature, to care for nature, uh, and it, but it push, pushes it into the territory where by elevating animals um, and by humanising them, it actually has an effect where um, uh, people are dehumanised. And that's really what I was trying to get at with the, with the piece. Yeah, and Dominic, do you see this love going into something a bit more sinister? No, you know, I've been involved in Whitehall and government and industry and then on to wildlife and conservation in my career. So, you know, I've not come this sort of far from a a perspective where I put animals before people. I think there is a huge caring, compassionate movement for animal welfare and wildlife protection in this country. And I think it's a very good thing. It makes me proud to be British. There's much that divides us politically, you know, Brexit and issues around immigration and the economy and everything else. But actually you'll find a lot of common ground between people on the left and right of the spectrum when it comes to wanting to protect animals. And I see the animal welfare movement as being just as important in my view as the anti-slavery movement, the universal suffrage movement, the civil rights movement. And I think people who are behind it, and many are on the right behind it. This is not a movement that is necessarily collected to the left. You know, I can think of people like Andrea Jenkins, MP. I can think about Trudy Pritchard, who's been hugely influential in Operation Arc. I can, you know, Rod Little, your associate editor, has been helping me a lot on Geronimo and also on Operation Arc in recent weeks. You know, this is a movement that has very strong links in the right wing of politics, in, in the conservative supporter base. And I think those people that read your magazine and, and, and understand many of the issues you're concerned about are deeply concerned about animals and, and I don't think we should underestimate that and I think what we've seen with regards to issues like Geronimo and, and Operation Arc is, is a, a connection with people. You know, people look at Helen MacDonald and think actually 
I can feel for her and her relationship with that alpaca. I feel for her fighting with this government department for five years just to get a decent test to prove the animal doesn't have TB. And they were absolutely horrified the way that DEFRA went onto that farm with people with hazmat suits on, like they come out of a nuclear reactor and actually drag the animal away. There's, there's no one who would say that was something that should happen in, in a civilized society. And when it came to Penn and, and Operation Ark, remember that was a humanitarian mission. You know, it started with me because I sit on the board of the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, Veterinary Nurses Council. I was very concerned about the veterinary nurses, about their, you know, young women that have been trained, given the opportunities to do veterinary nurse and veterinary work because of money that was raised from Britain and America. You know, our soldiers died over 450 in that war. They, they invested their, with their blood and their lives to give a generation the opportunity to be empowered, not least women. And that's where that started. And that's why it got so much hold. And that's why the Royal College of Veterinary Surgeons, the British Veterinary Association, big businesses like Vets for Pets all got behind it, wrote to the Prime Minister. And it was that that started it. The animals were just part of the picture. We wanted to rescue the animal rescuers. And if we could bring the animals with us as well, then that was something that would be good. And they'd all come off that plane. I don't think there would have been any dispute about how wonderful that was out of this terrible sad saga that was going on in Afghanistan. So I think, yes, we have hit a chord. I think this summer has shown how people care. But I think it's not just unique to, to Britain. You know, if you look at what's been going on in the US in the last few days, there's a huge outcry now about dogs being left on the runway at Kabul airport. The Department of Defense took military dogs, but it didn't take contractor dogs, and they're left wandering around, and the media are all looking at them, and it's going all the way up to the White House, and Fox News, and a lot of commentators on the conservative side of the debate in America are really pushing this debate to say that should never have happened. If we'd have left the dogs that Penn had on that runway, you'd have had a similar debate here in Britain. People would have been going very angry indeed. And one final point, I suppose, and I don't agree with this, but a lot of people that subscribe to your magazine are on the right of politics, probably would rather have dogs coming in than people. I don't believe in that. You know, I'm a believer in, in bringing people people into this country as refugees and settling them because I think we have to do that. But there is a view maybe that animals go before people in some people's minds. It's not something I share. I think if we're, if we're good to animals, we're generally good to people. And I think that's a strong point in British society. and We should be very proud of that. I mean, I'm very glad you, you, uh, you, you don't think that uh, uh, we should put animals before, before people. But I was struck in just then, um, Dominic, when you, when you did compare the, the pet liberation movement to slavery. Um, which I just find a very interesting comparison because I do make the point in the piece that this, these comparisons between wanting to, uh, to help animals but comparing them to these you know, terrible uh, uh, things that people in history had to, had to suffer through, um, I do think that has a dehumanizing effect on people. Even if that's not the intention, I think that that is what happens. I mean, I, in my piece, I mentioned uh, Peter, the, the animal, animal rights uh, organization, um, the largest animal rights organization in the world. Uh, and their 2003 Holocaust on your plate campaign, where they, they juxtaposed images of uh, battery hens alongside uh, concentration camp inmates and with, the, with the words to chickens or to hens, perhaps, I can't remember. No, to animals, I think. To animals, all people are Nazis. Uh, and that, to me, seems so blatantly wrong. Even if that comes, again, from a good place of wanting to, to look after animals and treat them well, um, when you're getting to that sort of stage where, where you're dehumanizing people in that way, um, supposedly out of the benefit for animals, I, I do think that's, that's, that's nasty. And, and I would also say that, the, um, that yes, you, you say that, the, that you don't believe in prioritizing animals ahead of people, but I think what the whole sort of saga, I suppose, um, around Operation Ark showed to me is that there are a lot of people in the general public who disagree with that, which I find quite dismaying. I'm glad we both share the opinion that that is a dismaying thing. But that we, I, I also mentioned in the piece this call uh, made to LBC by a member of the public who, you know, when asked if it really was a choice between getting someone on the plane as, uh, who's not an interpreter uh, and getting a, a dog on a plane, you saying, put the dog on. Uh, and she said, yes. Uh, and you could say, you know, there's just the one member of the public, um, you know, doesn't represent wider beliefs. However, there is that uh, YouGov poll uh, putting 40% uh, now of the public claim that they see animal lives as equal to, uh, in worth, human lives. So th th it is, it, I think it is a growing trend. It is still a minority trend, but it is a growing one. And I think that once you've, once you've crossed that line from the very admirable causes of animal welfare, and in, but into the, into the territory where you want animals to have rights as akin to human rights, that's, I think, very worrying. Yeah, you know, we'll just sort of address a few of those points. You know, I don't agree with the, the comparisons between the Holocaust. Having a partner who lost relatives in the Holocaust, you know, and having met many Holocaust survivors and studied that period of history very well, 
I'm not going to accept that we should be making those comparisons. So I don't agree with what Petter does in that area. Um, even though I know some Holocaust survivors have made those comparisons, uh, yes. and they've got a right to do so if they choose yes, to they do have right. bearing in mind what they've been through. Um, but if we look at the issue of slavery, for example, and we look at the, uni the universal suffrage and civil rights, this was trying to improve the, the rights of people and, 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 and to move society forward. And I think what I'm trying to say is that actually animal welfare and animal rights is moving society forward. You know, there's real horror, for example, that we spend so much time trying to improve the situation with dogs. And I work with many conservative MPs and ministers most recently on trying to ensure that we get uh, mandatory checks on microchips before dogs are euthanized. We've had huge support from the government on that, and I'm really grateful for it. But it, it strikes me that if we're taking so much action to protect dogs that we have as companion animals, we still allow dogs to be bred by American companies, like with this firm in, 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 in Huntingdon, MBR Resources, that actually breeds over 20,000 dogs in a facility in New York and over 2,000 here to go into chemical tests. And I've worked in the industries where these tests are undertaken. They're outdated, they're outmoded, mostly for pesticides and household chemicals. And it's absolutely horrendous. And quite rightly now that uh, you know, Priti Patel as Home Secretary is being put under pressure to look at why we have regulations like that that force the use of those types of animals. It's the same with using primates in animal experiments. I want to see that end. I think most civilized people would want to see that end. I think most civilized people would want to see dog experiments end. And I think we should be moving in that direction and we should be proud that we can bring that about. I think in relation to Operation Arc, as I said, you know, to me, the only reason we got so much traction with Operation Arc was because the dogs were part of the story. Otherwise, that group of Afghans would just be another group of people that were faceless lists. And you know their emails never even opened in the Foreign Office with hundreds of names. But what we were able to do is we were able to put faces and their work with animals together. And really, it was the animals that would have got the people home, if you understand the logic of what we were doing. The animals would have got safe passage for the people. And to me, that was the story. Because they cared for the animals, they were the animal rescuers, would rescue them too. And that's what we were trying to do. So we're making a direct connection. We weren't saying pets before people. That was something that Mr. Wallace and his political advisors in MOD came out with because they were trying to delay the operation. And I think they got egg over their face because other parts of government from Downing Street down, the Foreign Office and Home Office, could see what we were trying to do. And even DEFRA, and I have my differences massively with them on the killing of, of Geronimo the alpaca, were really helpful on all aspects of getting those animals safely into the UK and into, into quarantine kennels where they are. So this idea that you know we're trying to push an agenda that's putting people second and animals first, I don't think that's the case. What we're trying to say is we move society forward forward. We improve the rights of animals. We improve the rights of people. You know, there's a lot of evidence to show you that when people are violent towards animals, you know, if you want to go back to the Moors murderers and you see what, you know, that was going on at that time where cats and dogs were being killed before they turned on children, uh, you can see there's lots of evidence that people that are psychopathic towards animals and, and kill them will take that anger out on people as well. So, you know, compassion towards animals is something we should welcome in our society. It's a good thing. It means that we have less violence towards people as well. It makes us a better society. And I think Britain can be proud of the fact that organizations like WWF started here, RSPCA, Compassion in World Farming, the Born Free Foundation. You know, I work with Virginia McKenna, who's 90, that's incredible and still does amazing work in this area. All of these people have put Britain on the map for being the center of, 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 of an animal welfare movement. And to be fair to the government, they are trying to capture that too with their animal welfare strategy, you know, with people working in government from Zach Goldsmith with Carrie Johnson in Downing Street with Stanley Johnson and all the people that talk out on these things. I do think it's a good thing. It's not something to be negative about. There are huge challenges. There'll always be debates about where people come into this and where animals come into it. But equally, I think any politician that underestimates the power of this growing force, as Theresa May did in 2019 on the Hunting Act and the Ivory Act, she paid a heavy price politically for that and partly lost her majority because of it. Boris Johnson, I think, didn't make the same mistake in 2020 election, sorry, 2017, I'm talking about Theresa May, but in 2019, Boris Johnson didn't make the same mistake. Uh, but at the end of the day, you know, all of us realise now that this is a growing force in politics and I'm happy to be part of that. Yes, yeah, so it definitely is a growing force in politics. I mean, I, I, I made that point in, in the piece. I, I, I think you're completely right about that. But I don't think that necessarily means that the, the public shift in, in how they perceive animals is right, even if it is popular. I mean, you said there that the, that, um, the reason that people you know, got so invested in Operation Arc was the, uh, because the animals were involved with it. And I think you're completely right. And I also think that's very dismaying. I mean, I thought the most telling bit of the whole thing was the, um, when Penn Farthing, obviously under a lot of stress, um, uh, sent that voicemail message that was leaked to the government aid. And I thought the telling part about that was when he said that he would, um, uh, he could turn the country against him uh, through social media. And I think he's right. 
You know, I think I think he didn't he didn't even need to 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 give that uh, sort of order of um, attack because there were already people who were uh, passionate passionate enough about the issue and worked up enough about it to be doing uh, that already and to be uh, harassing people involved in the evacuation of Kabul. And I I, I do find that pretty dismaying. Um, and then on the point you made a point about primates and experimentation. Um, and uh, there was a very good point made by Baroness Deitch when talking about um, criticisms of the animal sentience bill. And I think it was a good point, which was uh, that our COVID-19 vaccines, um, they came into fruition because of early experimentation on mice and ferrets and primates. And a primate is obviously, and it's a beautiful animal, it's a very um, advanced uh, animal um, in terms of sentience. Um, but that was an example that, you know, if we didn't have those vaccines now, it's estimated that as many as 100,000 more lives could have been lost in this country to COVID. We'd probably all still be in lockdown, which has greater costs on, on society and on, on people's lives uh, and, and their rights as, 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 as humans to, to, to you know, leave their own homes. Um, and so that was an example where if, if, that, if the primates had had rights that meant uh, on a par with human rights that it meant that they had, couldn't have uh, these COVID experimentation on them, you know, there's a, we would not have had these vaccines or at least not had them as fast as we had them uh, in this sort of race against time against the virus. So that's a sort of another example in my mind of where, um, you know, you, the, the animal welfare in my mind is best when it is trying to minimize unnecessary suffering to animals. I mean, the abhorrence of cruelty, I think, is a, is a, is a, is a wonderful trait to have to abhor cruelty. But there are examples, difficult examples, I think, where, where suffering is necessary with animals um, in order that human lives and human dignity um, can be helped. And that's well, I'm very. I think I mean, just to come back on, on, the, on the, but that is on the, the experiment of the situation, I think. Yeah, just to come back on the experimentation issue because it's important. You make a fair point. You know, primates were used a small number of primates in an American university for the uh, um, the AstraZeneca Oxford University vaccine process. Um, it wasn't the case for the Pfizer side of things. Um, but the one thing we learned actually with regards to what happened with those vaccines is that they moved to human trials really quickly. The level of animal experimentation in relation to those COVID vaccines has been tiny compared with other non-pharmaceutical based you know, regulatory systems, including for household chemicals and, and pesticides and other things. And it shows actually when the pressure is on and when government regulators allow this to move to human trials quickly, we can get these medicines to the market and we can get them into people's arms in this case and save you know, millions of lives. I think the problem is not with the use of animals, it's with the regulatory system that forces the use of animals. I think if you speak to most large companies, I used to work in the agrochemical industry and, and I used to have this debate all the time, the companies I worked with did not want to use animals in experiments, but they were forced to use them because of the regulatory system that was in place. And often they would have disputes with the US regulators or European regulators about the need to do it. So I think, you know, it isn't a necessary evil that we have to kill animals in, to do all these experiments. I think that the COVID-19 trials and the, the, the rapid move to get those vaccines into people, which has been miraculous, and I'm hugely grateful to everyone involved as you are, and we all should be, um, has shown that actually the, the level of animal experimentation needed is, is, is much smaller than it has been in the past in those processes. And actually we can get to, to, to trial much more quickly with human trials. Well, I think and I it's think extremely good that, it's, that it is lessening. I mean, that is an excellent... We, we can get there. I think the government are committed to that and I think we will get there. So I think it is a step in the right direction. But just to come back on, on, on the pen farthing issue, because I want to clarify that the phone call, because, you know, Mr. Quentin and the aide, I spoke to Mr. Quentin an hour before Penn made that phone call and I, I tore a strip off Mr. Quentin without any expletives because I was well aware of what he was doing in Whitehall to delay getting a flight authorization, working with, under the direction of Mr. Wallace. And I said to him, we are having real problems here. You know, unless we can get the authorization via the Ministry of Defense to get into that airport, we're not going to be able to get a, a, a contractor to fly in and the number of aircraft that we have available are diminishing by the hour. We have the money to do this. And I was going from operators in Istanbul to operators in, in Eastern Europe to, to operate 
operators in, in the United Arab Emirates and, and Cairo and all of them were saying, listen, you've not got us a flight number, we can't get you the plane, and if we can't get you the plane, it's not going to happen. So Quentin was in the firing line, he got the criticism he deserved, he was muddying the waters with ministers. I made it very clear in a number of interviews. Uh, what happened with Penn was he was exasperated, he was at the end of his tether, uh, his people were under direct risk, he was under direct risk, yes, he was under pressure, so he left a very expletive ridden um, message. I think most people in that situation were probably done the same, Dominic, to be quite frank. I, and I think actually the release of that, the, the release of that tape to the Sunday Times, which I had a long discussion with them before they published it, I, in my view, was fundamentally wrong. And I've debated with Mr. Wallace, and I'll continue Dominic, to yeah. about what he did on that issue. Can I cut? Can I cut in here because we're running out of time and it's a fascinating discussion we're having here. But I just wanted you um, to respond to William Will, Will's point about social media and the fact that the content of that voicemail was Penfarthing knowing very well what he could unleash. Do you not think that? I mean, I know that you're a keen user of Twitter yourself. Do you not think that a lot of this is whipping up mob mentality in, in, in a sentimental way? You know, there, there are so many animals who get put down because of TB, or you know, so many animals that will suffer in war zones, but you know, it's, it's social media that's really making well, something like Can I explain like to you what, what, what would you have done in my situation, okay? We'd worked all week, you know, the Prime Minister had approved the visas for, the, for people to leave the 68 through Pretty Patel, okay? We had the whole of DEFRA working on getting the animals in, okay? I had the money on the table from a wealthy American investor in the United States, Spencer Haber, to get the plane that we needed to get on the airport. I'd worked on it for 10 days and I had a political aide suddenly in the shadows in, in Whitehall, in the Ministry of Defence, basically telling ministers to back off. Of course I was angry. You know what I do? No, 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 I did two th I, can I just explain what, I, what we did? I took to social media, okay? And I made a direct appeal to the Prime Minister to say intervene after the G7 summit. I made a little video on my phone. I got over 350,000 shares on it. it. went straight to Downing Street, all the people sharing. Because, yes, they got actually bombarded by it. And at 1.50 in the morning, Mr. Wallace, clearly under huge pressure from the Prime Minister, put out a tweet saying he changed his policy 360 degrees. We could take the animals in, we could take the people in, and we could get the plane. Okay, then I went on Good Morning Britain, and I basically said that, you know, this is a really difficult time. We need to get that plane on the ground as soon as possible. I was in tears, millions of people watching it. And then Wallace blunders in and starts to abuse me and say that basically I was talking nonsense, I was abusing troops. He was slaughtered. Charlotte Hawkins basically pulled him up saying, what are you doing? He'd been on the television and radio the day before saying we were talking bollocks. He was making himself look stupid. He was making Downing Street extremely uncomfortable. He was trying to undermine a policy that the whole of government had lined up to support. And ultimately, ultimately, he was endangering lives because we couldn't get those people through the gate. And in the end, we didn't. I hold him responsible for that. I've got to try and get them out as others out of Afghanistan. That's a bloody difficult thing. And Dominic Rabb flying to Pakistan today, and we've got hundreds of other people that are in a very dangerous situation. I won't forgive him for that. He didn't need to delay that flight. The minute that he made that tweet, the minute the Downing Street forced him to change, I had the Air Commodore ringing me directly in the morning via his office to say, Dominic, you can have all the flight authorization details you need. Just pass us on to your operators, which I did, and we got it all sorted. That could have been sorted days before. So that's why that phone call was made from Penn Farthing. That's why I ripped a strip off Peter Quentin. That's why I went to war with Ben Wallace in the media. And that's why ultimately he lost. Dominic Dyer, Will Moore, we'll have to leave it there, but thank you for joining Spectator TV. And last... Are boarding schools emotionally stunting boys who then grow up to ruin the country through politics? That's the argument that the author Richard Beard makes in a new book, Sad Little Men, reviewed in the latest issue of The Spectator by Nicholas Lazard. Richard is a product of boarding school himself and writes that he recognises much of the traits in prime ministers like David Cameron and Boris Johnson from his boarding school life. Richard Beard, welcome to Spectator TV. First, what led you to writing this book? Uh, well, we're in the start of the first lockdown and I was seeing uh, the way that uh, we were being led by our by our government by um, uh, Prime Minister Johnson in particular uh, and I was thinking how I recognized many of his behaviors uh, and they seemed to be traceable back to um, to his education which um, I share although in different schools the same form of education and I suddenly felt that it was very important to bring this news back to everybody else who hadn't um, experienced it so that the links could be seen between um, a lot of these kind of ticks and habits which we start to take for granted, but I think do have their source very clearly in early life. What sort of ticks are we talking about here? Yeah. Well, I think the, um, I mean, in the book, in Sad Little Men, I go through the uh, uh, various things that can be traced. I think an obvious one is the joking, the fact that that everything must be seen to be uh, a bit of a laugh as a way of disarming it, really. So if nothing's important, nothing can can hurt you. Uh, and it's a form of self-defense, which is used um, in boarding schools in particular. Um, and 
uh, it can be then extended out into life so that anything which seems tricky or anything which makes you feel vulnerable can just be made into a joke. Um, and, uh, and I think that's one form of behaviour which, which clearly uh, runs very deep um, in many of our public school politicians. So, I mean, self-defence is not a notion one usually assumes uh, uh, that comes with school. Was boarding school particularly, or is boarding school a particularly traumatic experience? Well, I think self-defence is an essential art to learn, probably in all schools, but um, in an exaggerated way in a boarding school, because you have no one else to, to do that defence for you. Uh, you are left there on your own, um, among other boys, all of whom are trying to, to hide their own sadness and hi hide their own vulnerabilities. Uh, and, and the best form of, of defence ultimately become, becomes attack or becomes a, this kind of wall of, uh, um, against emotions of any kind, because if by showing emotions, you can become very, very vulnerable. Um, and therefore, I think self-defence uh, is very important in these schools. And it's one of the first things you learn. Um, you learn, for example, not to show that you're sad and homesick uh, as your parents drive away. Uh, that becomes a very important lesson, which then can be applied to all sorts of other situations. You know, if in doubt, just close down, put up a wall. I mean, has it been cathartic for you to write this book? Because I know that you write that you've now moved back to your close to your boarding school. So is there some kind of complex psychology going on there? Well, I, I think there was, but it was before I wrote the book. I, 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 so I was here in lockdown and I found that I'm living half a mile um, from the school I went to, which is Radley College in uh, Oxfordshire. Uh, and I suddenly thought, well, this isn't so innocent, but I mean, true to my own type, my own character type, um, I hadn't bothered to look into that very deeply until we all had nothing to do and I was allowed out, you know, once a day for an hour. So it seemed an obvious place to go and to go and kind of rummage around, um, both now in the present and, and in terms of the past. The book is very much about the past of these schools. I went to boarding school in 1975, which was the same year as David Cameron uh, and Boris Johnson. Um, and I feel sort of very um, ready to talk about that period. Uh, but not necessarily about the schools as they are now. Um, but about that period, I do feel that I'm an expert. And um, I've read up on lots of uh, experts from the psychological field as well. It's kind of a growing field. Um, and they very much say that there are issues here which need to be, need to be addressed. Um, and I hope to popularise some of their more academic arguments in the book as well. What about it was particularly traumatising? Because is it just the separation from your parents and not seeing them for weeks on end? Or is there something else? You know, we so you often hear about public school culture and bullying, that sort of stuff. Is there anything that, that's that inherent in these schools, at least of that period, um, that made it particularly traumatising? Well, I think that the, the separation is the main thing. But I do want to say that you know, I personally... Um, was not bullied. I personally didn't have a particularly terrible time. In many ways, I had the best time possible because I was very good at sport. Um, I was towards the top of the class. Um, and uh, so therefore, I had that kind of status of a, a the schoolboy seek, again, in, in a kind of defensive way. So it's not really about these specific traumas, about bullying. I mean, there are other books which um, are about um, the paedophilia, which um, was present in these schools in the 70s. That's not something that I have experienced. Um, and my point really is that I had a kind of normal or a standard to good time um, in, in my public school. And yet still that basic trauma of separation from the family and then the social consequences of being segregated from wider society. Um, the, the psychosexual consequences of being separated from uh, girls and women um, and from from again, from 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 uh, what would be considered a normal community life. All those things will affect boys who went to these schools at that time, whether they like it or not, whether they were successes or not, whether they were the bullies or the bullied. Um, and it doesn't really matter what your specific, um, if you were specifically uh, traumatised by individual events. It's, it's, the, it's the fact of having gone there will have these long term consequences, um, I think, whatever the experience. Mm. Well, Richard, can I push back a bit here? Because you mentioned Boris Johnson, you mentioned David Cameron, and understandably, a lot of people, you know, don't like them or the way that they do things. But boarding school has also given us people like Rishi Sunak, who are a little bit more balanced, less about joking around, more about perhaps working hard and more. Uh, you've, it's also given us Churchill, Orwell, John le Carré, <laughs> the list goes on. So are you being a bit unfair here? 
Well, the, of the of the of the people you mentioned there, the Churchill um, famously didn't like his his schools and didn't want to claim any of his sort of character coming from them. And John le Carre very much uh, outspoken against um, against public schooling and uh, his experience uh, as a teacher at Eton. Um, and um, I think that that's uh, that, that's quite revealing in itself. Um, I'm not quite sure what your pushback kind of is. Is to say that there are different types of people who come out of the schools. That, that's clearly true. Um, and again, I would say I'm looking at the specific period. I think Rishi Sunak is a bit younger. I think uh, children who are in these schools now will exhibit different behaviours later on. I do think there are some things which haven't changed, which are still problematic. And this segregation from uh, the wider community is one of those problems which will have um, an impact and will have consequences later. I mean, clearly people can react in different ways. And there are people who go on to live amazingly useful um, lives, um, have altruistic careers. Well, you're a sixth um, novelist. Are wonderful people. Um, but they do that often in spite of their education. Right. Because, of course, one of the consequences is that you can then compensate and even overcompensate to try and um, sort of make up for that lost time. Um, so I'm not, not, I would never say that, you know, that's kind of one size fits all in the consequences. It can go exactly the other, other way, but it is in spite of that education. Um, and it's interesting then that the school will often try and claim that success for themselves. Um, and I do know anecdotally of you know, well-known individuals in uh, humanitarian fields who really try very hard not to let the schools do that. And Richard, finally, um, you say that your experience is pegged to the 1970s and that now it might be different. I mean, boarding schools certainly today are probably a bit, a bit more pampered, at least certainly more international in their cohort. So do you think that your, the, the, the things that you find in your book apply to the later generations of people who go to boarding school or are an argument against the institution of boarding schools today? Well, I think that's the kind of thing which we're going to find out in 30 years time when if society doesn't change, um, heaven forbid, that uh, the same kind of people will be in charge. People who go to the same schools will be in charge. Uh, certainly, this is something which came back in the in, in when when Cameron became um, prime minister in 2010. I think a lot of people thought this would never happen again. The big public schools wouldn't be providing our leadership. But if they're still doing so in 30 years time, then whatever those children are experiencing now, um, the boys and girls as they are now who will become the men and women who are in charge, we will then see what the consequences are. And it's a bit too late, probably, if things um, are as problematic as they are at the moment. Richard Beard, thanks for joining Spectator TV. And that's it for this week. If you enjoyed this episode, don't forget to subscribe to the Spectator's YouTube channel so you never miss an episode. Just click the subscribe button at the bottom of this video and the bell icon. Thanks for watching and do join us again next week.